Welcome to the station of decapitation without your head. I'm Nasty Neal, and I'm jo- joined by Eric Swellstead, director of Heartland of Darkness. It's very cool to have you here. Oh, thanks for having me. This is great. Yeah. So it's coming out on Blu-ray. It was shot on video many years ago uh, from Visual Vengeance from Wild Eye, who uh, they put out, they're starting to do these, and I really enjoy watching these movies. There's a charm to them. We're going to go over it. But what was that process like to take a shot on video film and move it to Blu-ray? Yeah, so it was actually shot on 16 millimeter negative. Yeah, back in uh, the late 80s. And uh, we didn't finish it. We ran out of money to finish it. uh, uh, And, you know, it got progressively more expensive to finish something shot on film and get it transferred. We had to do the mix. We had some visual effects we had to add. So there was a lot of things that we had left to do that we just didn't get a chance to do. So finally... Uh, we were able to get the funds together to finally release this. We're thrilled that Visual of Vengeance is giving us the Criterion level uh, release with this Blu-ray. Yeah. It's great, all these cool extras that they've got. And uh, yeah, we're just thrilled to finally have it out there. So it's never, it wasn't released on video or anything. Wow. Never. There were, there were a couple of, of, of attempts over the years to try to release it. But we were we weren't happy with the release plan, and the film wasn't quite where I wanted it to be finished. So we kind of didn't do that. But with this one, it's done. We're ready to go. It's finally coming out. What's that? I mean, okay. So I finished my first feature film, and it's it, it premiered uh, in August. Nice. But we had a two year. Uh, we had to wait a couple of years because of COVID, which was very frustrating. But sure. what's an experience like over decades? You know, I assume at some point you just think, you know, this is just never coming out. Yeah, you you kind of you get frustrated. And this kind of had a this had a a, kind of a legendary status to it because it was shot in 1989. And here we are 33 years later. It was considered the lost film of Linnea Quigley, the actress. Mm -hmm. And, you know, everybody was like, oh, when's that movie ever going to get done? And, you know, we just didn't have an answer for them. We were like, well. We're going to wait for the right time, get the right finishing on the film. And when that happens, we'll release it. And then finally, we got there. But it it took us many, many years of patient waiting for just the right circumstances, the right money to come into play. Because as you as you know, it's tough to get to the finish line. It's easy to write a script, I think, and have an idea and then to to do that idea. But the challenge is to get done to get it to get it edited and released and uh, we finally did this year yeah uh, it's funny you say that because uh, when i posted earlier today about the three years of getting the movie together and uh michael uh who i made the movie with he was like it's a miracle that a movie gets made at all and yeah it really is i think i mean they, they say that all the time i forget who the uh i want to say it's either, either tarantino or kevin smith one of those filmmakers said that they really just love all movies because they recognize how hard it is to get the film finished. I mean, a lot of people have ideas that they never get to see. Mm -hmm. And to have a film that you wrote, shot, cast, directed, and released, it's quite an undertaking, as you know. And when you finally get to that point, it's like, ah, finally. And that's how we felt. Yeah. Yeah. So how did it come about uh, with uh, Visual uh, Vengeance? Now, did they contact you? Did you contact them? Yeah, it was through Wild Eye Releasing. Uh, we caught, we, we, they, they saw, they heard about the film. Uh, they contacted it through a friend of mine who actually ended up doing the music for this movie, which is great. And he recommended them. He has another film out with Wild Eye that got really good reviews and got a good distribution. And he recommended Wild Eye And then they were telling us that they have a new label, this visual vengeance, which takes a look at older films and the ones that never really got a good release Mm -hmm. and looks at them and packages them and gets them back out again. And that, that to me was the great thing about this because this movie had long been thought of as being lost. You know, in fact, it was called the lost Linnea Quigley film. And then finally, like I said, the circumstances were right to finally get it out there. And Visual Vengeance has just been a great partner in helping us do that. The, the, the features on this release 
are phenomenal. It's a criterion level release, which which we were thrilled with. Yeah, I saw because I, I got a screener, but it's not the same because I saw all the, like all this stuff and I was like, oh, that's very exciting. And yeah, uh, it's got like, a, I, I think it's commentary and, and yeah, three, and, three and, commentaries. Oh, nice. Yeah. I'm a big fan of commentary tracks. Um, it's kind of a silly thing to say if they're good ones. Obviously, if they're bad, you wouldn't be a fan of them. But uh, right. I, I think you, you learn so much and you see you, you get to see the movie in a different light when you listen to the commentary tracks. I think so, too. We've also got a really cool uh, documentary, a behind-the-scenes documentary. You may have seen that, too, called Deeper Into the Darkness, and it's all about the making of the film, and I get a lot of the principal people to talk about that. And, yeah, the bonus feed, there's a poster. The bonus features are really, really great with this. And, again, you know, it's kind of a criterion-level release yeah. for a film that had been rumored out there but never actually seen, and now people can finally check it out for themselves. Yeah, and a big thing, you know, people talk about streaming versus, uh, you know, um, physical media. And that's a big thing that makes the physical media worth buying is all the extras that, the, that are on so. the disc. Yeah, I think it is, too. I mean, I collect DVDs. I, You know, today it's a lot of streaming stuff. But I, I still like the, the physical product in your hand, holding it in your hand. So when you go and you buy something either online or at the store, you're taking it and you're getting, you're taking the wrap off. You get a physical item that you can hold on to, you can collect, you can revisit whenever you want. I I miss those days. And I, I love that they're doing it with this kind of release. Yeah. And uh, Visual Vengeance themselves, um, not just because, you know, I'm, I have you hear anything, but I've really been enjoying watching uh, the stuff they've been putting out. Because They've been great. They've been, they've been finding a lot of lost, treasured films and releasing them which which is really for any horror film fans uh you know desire that's great they finally get out there and you get to see them mm -hmm. so how did you get Linnea originally for the movie so we we shot the film in 1989 at the height of the satanic panic mm -hmm. that was gripping the nation i was 13 at the time i remember the time yeah yeah yeah, yeah. it was <laughs> it was a crazy time and you had people seeing uh cults everywhere i mean in schools in law enforcement it was everywhere so people were freaking out about that so when we were doing the film we always wanted we, we knew as any as any uh distributor will tell you if you want to get your film out there you need to get a name you need to get somebody in the film that audiences will recognize doesn't have to be tom cruise right. but it needs to be a name even if it's like you know a, a, an actor actress that's done some 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 genre films that people will know them for that's great so we we made a list of all the actors and actresses that we would we would think would be interested in doing uh this low budget film and top of the list was Linnea and we we never thought we would we could get her she had uh, of course, you know, The Return of the Living Dead a few years before this she was already a, a famous name she'd done uh a uh, bunch of uh, chainsaw, you know, all yeah. those great films, yeah, yeah. those Hollywood chainsaw classes. hookers. And yeah, yeah, yeah. And we, you know, we were like, "There's no way we're going to get the great Linnea Quigley," uh, but we did. We reached out to her people, and they were like, "Oh, she'd love to do a film." And you know, I wrote her a part to be a witch, and in the film, she's Julia Francine, a mysterious witch who seduces people, seduces men, and such. So when I when I wrote the part just for Linnea. She 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 called me and said, I always wanted to play a witch. I, I don't know how you knew that, but that was all. She says, I played everything else you can think of. I never got to play a witch. And I said, well, now you do. So it was as easy as that to get her, but it was great working with her. Yeah, she's super nice and always supportive. Uh, she's been supporting me for the show for years. And yeah, um, even like people I know, I'm in Massachusetts. She's out in L.A., but she's uh, she's been in music videos for people mm -hmm. I know in Boston. And yeah, just yeah. Uh, if she's in, if she likes whatever you're doing, she's going to be very supportive of it. Very supportive and, and very I mean, we, we were shooting in the top of the summer in Ohio, which is humid as hell. And she was a little sick at the time. And but she, you never would know it. She she jumped in front of the camera when I said action. She was ready to go, uh, and you know, cut. She would collapse into her chair, but she was always ready to go. A true professional, and she's been great ever since. And people would go up to her conventions and say, "When is that lost Lin Linnea Quigley film of yours?" And she'd say, "Well, I don't know. I keep hoping that they release it." 
And then finally, you know, this past year, we were able to tell her, it's done, finally. And so she did an interview with us. That's also on the DVD. And, you know, she was saying it was great. Finally, the film's out. All my fans have been asking. And now it's finally done. Yeah. I was literally just talking to her before this interview. Cool. Um, I was trying to get her on, but uh, time-wise, we couldn't work it out. Yeah. But, uh, she, she, again, she's very supportive of the movie coming out and people seeing it. Yeah. Uh, she recently hurt her knee, but uh, yeah. hopefully she's on the men. Uh, but, yeah, yeah, just a really nice person. Wonderful person. Great actress. A very yeah, talented. Very nice. And what a wonderful soul that she has she helps a lot of animals out and so that's kind of her yeah. cause and she's great just a great person in general mm -hmm. so uh when you you shoot it in 89 and what were the plans at the time to get it out were you going to try to get it out in the video stores you're going to try to get it at theaters yeah that's exactly the plan so the plan kind of modeled after rodriguez robert rodriguez hadn't yet made a name but i found out later that that that's exactly what he did with with uh, El Mariachi. But our plan was to shoot the film. And back in the late 80s, video stores, I mean, there was something called Blockbuster, which is long gone now. But the, all these video stores were everywhere, mom and pop and the chains. Yeah. And our goal was to get it into the video stores so that, you know, we could get a name. We could we could finally get a little bit of money and make, you know, make a little bit, maybe make another one after that. So we were all ready to do that. Uh, that was the plan, and we put together a marketing plan, a proposal. We had to raise the money through private investors, uh, which is always tricky because you've got to go to people that have money and convince them to invest the money uh, into your film. So we, we were able to do that, but eventually we kind of ran out of money. I mean, there was there's a limit to how much you can do. And about that time, uh, I moved out to L.A., uh, trying to get the finishing funds, trying to get the film finished here. But I lost some of the connections back in Ohio where the film was shot. So we, you know, without that constant revenue stream, things kind of got more difficult. And the film ended up sitting on a shelf. Uh, and every every year or two, I would try to go back and work on it some more. I dabbled with it. Okay, I can do the, I can do a mix. I can try to do another transfer. And keep in mind, back then, we didn't have Premiere we didn't have Avid. You know, we basically, you had to take your film, you had to transfer it to physical video, like Beta, Beta SP, yeah. and you had to go and then uh, use, use editing machines uh, to edit the physical film. And then now today, of course, we've got all these great computer products yeah, where you can... I've, yeah. I think so everyone we, today under a certain age has at least like a base knowledge how to edit, you know, something. Maybe sure. they can't edit a feature film, but they could edit a video either even on their phone or like an Adobe product or just yeah. have like a sort of a knowledge. Yeah. And you can also then there's also YouTube that will give you tutorials on anything you want to do. You know, uh, that's what I was wondering about, like. Did you go to film school? And if not, like, how did you, or did you go to film school? I did. And this was my master's thesis project. I went to the Ohio State University in Columbus, and they had a great film program back then, which has been resurrected. But we shot this as my thesis, me, me and, a, and the DP, the social producer, Scott Spears. We both got our master's with this film. We went to our advisor and said, hey, if we make a feature film, can we graduate with that? And he said, yeah, if you can do that. Uh -huh. So, you know, yeah, sure. <laughs> try it. So, yeah, it was all done as part of a, a graduate thesis. We raised the money. We got all the crew uh, to work on it. They were undergrads and they gave up their time. We got the actors, local actors to be in it. We got the locations for virtually free because you're shooting in Ohio and they don't know, you know, how much you can charge to shoot right. in a church or a, or a, you know, a, uh, a cemetery. They were like, oh, yeah, go ahead. So we got all that stuff and it was great. That's why I tell students all the time, shoot where get out of L.A. and make a film. It You'll be amazed at what you can get with that. Yeah, that's funny you said that because I have uh, like friends who moved out to L.A. And I said, did that make it better and some people say yeah but there are people who say no it's way worse because yeah. you can't shoot every if you everyone knows about movies so if you shoot anywhere you got to pay them and, yep. Yep. and anywhere you go everyone's a filmmaker so it's yep. you know it's that's different. exactly right everywhere you go and and you know everybody thinks they can do better they think on their phone and stuff and i i mean we all get that but there is something about going to film school studying the craft learning how to do it and uh, actually making a film there's something to that mm-hmm 
Uh, how about the church itself? Did they know, you know, it was a, a satanic movie? Like, uh, so did they have any issues with that? Or They never knew. <laughs> <laughs> we, we basically told them it was an action horror film. And we, we said there was stuff in a church. And they, they were like, oh, okay, that sounds good. And uh, they, you know, we, we gave them a little bit of money, you know, kind of like a tithing mm -hmm. kind of money to, uh, and we had, they had a night watchman that came in to make sure we weren't breaking the windows or anything. But man, we did everything in that church. We had, we had uh, shotguns being fired off. We had Linnea Quigley naked in that, in that church. I, I mean, we had so much going on in just that one location <laughs> yeah. and they they never really knew what we were doing in there but uh we had great time making it uh but, but yeah. <laughs> yeah hopefully they get to see it now yeah <laughs> yeah now they're gonna see it so who knows what's gonna happen but in la you never could do that no right um did the satanic elements have any um issues for you when you were trying to raise money not really i mean you know there there were of course people that said well I don't want to give money that promotes that stuff. And and I, I totally understood that. Actually, the film isn't really, you know, it happens to be a satanic right. cult. But it's, but it's not yeah, like, yeah, it's not promoting it's not Satanism that. or something. Yeah, like it's not just about that. It's about other things, too. It's an action action thriller. But, yeah, you know, there were, there were people that, that were reluctant about that. But for the most part, and this is the height of the satanic panic, like I said. So people were, were talking about this stuff, you know, learning about this. It was in the news. So I just was able to say, hey, we're making a film that talks about this stuff. And people would say, oh, that that's kind of topical. That's that's timely. That's a good idea. You're doing that now. Mm -hmm. And that's how we got around that. Yeah. Oddly enough, it's starting. Uh, it seems like it's kind of come back around the satanic panic. And <laughs> it is. It is. I, everything goes in circles. You know, <laughs> something, there's cycles. And, and I think we're back in it already. Yeah, it was. I, I posted about this a couple weeks ago. I was in Boston and. I was just going out to meet my friend Annabelle was going to pick me up at the bus station and the guy just started yelling at me. He was like, we, we don't like Satanists here. We curb stop Satanists. I was like, what the hell is this guy talking yeah. about? Because I, I, I was wearing a horror movie shirt or something. Uh, that's it. I was like, whoa, okay. <laughs> Have a nice day. It was, it was weird. right. Right. Yeah. There's people out there that are still believing. I mean, you know, there, there's, Every other month, there's like a news story about some kind of a cult or something. Maybe yeah. it's not satanic, but, it, you know, stuff about cults are are always in the news. And this film deals more with the cult uh, than anything else. You know, the guy's got uh, he the, the reverend, the evil reverend Donovan demands, you know, people to follow him. He's he's a very powerful leader. It's all about control and power. And, you know, there's always stories about those people out there in the news that mm -hmm. are always, I mean, Jim Jones was in the news when we made this film. Uh, you know, so there, there were, there's always been cult leaders that have popped up here and there, you know? Yeah. Now, how about uh, casting the Reverend? He's very good in it. Uh, Nick oh, he's Bauer. great. That That's the great Nick Baldesser. Nick and I met, uh, we both did Shakespeare in the park in Columbus. We did a play, a Shakespeare play, Julius Caesar. And I had a small little part, but Nick, had the famous Cassius, which is like one of the biggest, if not the biggest part, it's like right there. And uh, he got to play a really evil, conniving, wicked uh, man. And I, I said, I got to write a part for you, man. That that is great. Yeah. He was like, Yeah, if you can do it. So we worked on some other films together. Uh, me as an AD, him as an actor, and I kept seeing how incredible he was. So, you know, I, I decided to write this film and I wrote that part just for Nick. I, I said, I got to get Nick to play this part. And he did. And he was phenomenal. People have talked about his performance, you know, kind of a mixture of Shakespeare, Roddy McDowell. It's got a lot of great stuff going it's on. It's a very there. theatrical uh, performance. I mean, that's that in it. A good way. Yeah. 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 No, he was great to work with. A wonderful, wonderful actor. He still does the occasional performance in movies and still does Shakespeare uh, on in theater on, on stage. Oh. And he's just great to work with. Great guy. Yeah. He said Columbus. I'll actually be in Columbus in, in a couple weeks. Well, there you go. You yeah. should look him up. He's well, a great guy. Yeah. For, for <laughs> Nightmares uh, Film Festival. Oh, and very cool. That's awesome. So uh, Alistair Crowley's brought up in the movie, too, which uh, I always think is, is fun. Yeah, that, that's the great Satanist, uh, yeah. you know, b b Magic, uh, wrote a lot of stuff about that. 
Uh, of course, Ozzy Osbourne had a song, Mr. Crowd. It, it's, and I think that's one of the things we talk about a little bit in the film is how this stuff is kind of seeped into the public conscious. I mean, there's a scene where Linnea's with at a high school with a student who's the daughter of the lead character. And, you know, the, the girl is asking questions of the teacher. And one of them is, who was Alex Crowley? And the teacher's like, oh, yeah, he was a great Satanist. Yeah. So there, there's kind of a talk about that stuff in the film. And for horror fans, uh, you know, we're delving right into this stuff. We're going full bore into into some of the, the magic, the dark stuff that that is covered with that. Mm -hmm. And I think when you reference like people that existed in, in a fictional movie, it adds like a realism or, you know, mm -hmm. kind of grounds the movie. I always think that really works. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. When you when you bring it back to things that people can understand or heard of, heard about or relate to, it does make it more timely, more interesting. Yeah. And I'm sure people knew of him then, obviously, but oh, yeah. it does kind of seem like like I think he's more known today in a way like people. I think more people that you wouldn't think of would know who, the, who that is. Yeah, I think so, too. I mean, there was a famous story about a Jimmy Page of Led Zeppelin that when they were recording one of their albums, uh, he insisted on recording it in uh, Aleister Crowley's uh, mansion uh, in England. And he, you know, he he bought the place or rented it or whatever. And, you know, they did the whole I, I forget which album it was that they did. But yeah, I mean, I mean, and so people that listen to rock and roll today. It's like, yeah, you're listening to music, the music that was somewhat influenced by uh, by people that that were into that stuff. So, yeah, I think he's he's known a little bit today but in some circles. Uh, yeah. And both good and bad, you know, not just not just people that like think he's awesome, but people right, that right. were afraid of him, too, at the time, because he was into some dark stuff, man. Mm hmm. And uh, I saw on IMDb that uh, the name I don't know if it was originally or at some point was Blood Church. Yeah. So what happened was we were the film was originally called Fallen Angels. Uh, it was made under that. And then as the years went by, uh, Tom Cruise Showtime produced a series called Fallen Angels. Oh, okay. So that that kind of took. And then there's also a Hong Kong movie uh, that came out, Fallen Angel or whatever. So we realized we had to change the name. So we found a distributor at the time in Florida who wanted to call it Blood Church. And I wasn't thrilled about the name because it's kind of it wasn't really what we were talking about in the movie. Um, but the film briefly was called Blood Church. And fast forward to a few years down the road. And I was everybody was like, you can't with another name. I mean, that's kind of synonymous with, a, you know, it would never got released. So you should find their name. So I thought of the movie because the movie's set in the heartland of America. So I thought, well, why not, you know, Heartland of Darkness? Because that's really what it's about. And that's how the name came about. Some people have said, well, it's like Heart of Darkness, uh, the Joseph Conrad book and, and the documentary. No, it was more inspired by uh, Heartland. You know, the fact that it was set in the heartland right. of the Midwest. Yeah. Uh, that's really where the name came yeah. from. And at this point, you're not going to come up with any name that doesn't uh, sort of sound like something that's existed at some point in time. I mean, exactly. You, you know, hey, your own words or something. That's right. That's right. Everything is an homage. Everything is. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, during that time, how did that affect your your desire to make movies? Uh, did did that at some point be like I just don't want to be involved in movies, or did that never happen? No, I, I mean I I brought the film out to Los Angeles to try to finish the film, but I mean I got my I got my master's in writing and directing, so I wanted to pursue that, and I did. I worked at HBO, uh, did some music videos, uh, did some other. I got an Emmy nomination for a film I did here. I did some other feature films, and uh, but I never finished this one. But I was doing other things in the meantime. So, yeah, I mean, the last film I did, you can check out my IMDb page, but my last film I did was a Frankenstein film. Uh, I did see this. I'm very interested in seeing this, yeah. Oh, me too. It's got, it's got a hell of a cast. It's got an Oscar-winning actress, Margaret O'Brien. Uh, she's the she's the star one of the stars of the film. So I did other projects trying to get my the, the Heartland film uh, finished. Uh, but along the way, I you know I did other films and other stuff here, uh, all the time working on trying to finish this film. And yeah. I was finally able to get it done. Yeah. And now that it is, you know, soon it'll be available for people to get. And you've got a really cool um, package and everything. Yeah. Has that uh, reinvigorated like to make more things? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I'm I've always, I'm always working on stuff, uh, trying to find new ideas. Um, I'm currently a professor of film at a college here 
in Los Angeles. I'm telling my students all about this stuff. Uh, the last film I did, like I said, uh, was made with my students, just like I made this film at Ohio State with undergrad students. So, oh yeah, this, this totally invigorates me. I'm always thinking about another idea, uh, another script. I'm working on two or three scripts right now, uh, only one of which is a horror script. The other ones uh, are a little lighter than that, but I'm always working on stuff. The one I'm working on now is a supernatural thriller, which I, again, I love supernatural thrillers uh, based a little bit on Dante's Inferno, which oh. is really cool. Yeah. So I'm always working on stuff, trying to get a product out there. Yeah. yeah. Is the Frankenstein movie available uh, somewhere? Not yet. It's also ironically looking for distribution. We finished the, the film is done. Mm -hmm. We just need a distributor to bring it home. So we're, we're talking with a bunch of companies about that to check it it will be out it's called frankenstein rising we just have to get the uh the right company that the producers want to do business with yeah well hopefully you know now that this is uh coming out that helps you you know your name and you know exactly. you're like hey we you know more interest in it yeah that's my hope too is that you get some attention and and finally find its home find its release you know you're only as good as your last film as they say yeah. so I, I definitely want to see that film get out there yeah yeah so uh, what were some of the movies that you grew up watching that like made you think like, I want to, you know, I want to make movies. I want to make a horror movie. So I think for me, first off, I'm a Star Wars guy. I, I, I watched Star Wars when I was 13, blew me away. And I was like, OMG, that's what I want to do with my life. Then I got into horror films. I saw, of course, Alien. Uh, you know, absolutely. I mean, that was that was to me one of the best films ever. Yeah. Uh, The Exorcist still remains yeah, I, to me the most terrifying film, partly because it's based on reality. It's based on truth. You know, there mm -hmm. are demons and stuff like that. So to have a little girl uh, possessed by one was like ah, that was crazy. Yeah, I recently uh, read the book, actually, the the original right? book, and, and it's amazing. I, it might be my favorite horror novel, but that's um, I think that's probably the the best adaptation and the, the both the source material and the adaptation are great, which man, doesn't you, happen too often. If you read The Exorcist, man, that is that is a scary book. That is, is a it's, really scary. I mean, the, the movie was very scary, but yeah. the book alone, uh, with you know, Blatty got into some really interesting. I mean, the opening of the film, and I think the book has this too, where the father is in Iraq looking for the demon, right? And he's like, he's trying to find this demon. And then he finds them, and that's a haunting image of the demon against the sun. Mm -hmm. And he's like, I found you. I found you. Oh, I get chills just thinking about that scene. It's a great opening to a horror movie. Yeah, it's yeah, it's fantastic. Sorry to cut you off. I think you were going to go on to another movie, but. No, no. I, I oh. mean, I'm also, obviously, Frankenstein's, The Creature from the Black Lagoon. Those were all great films. Halloween. I mean, to me, Halloween is almost a perfect film. Uh, a new film that I encourage your listeners to definitely check out is a movie that came out a few years ago in the style of Halloween and The Exorcist is a movie called It Follows. Oh, yeah. It's a, oh, it's a phenomenal. What's great about it is it, it's, it's got a kind of an homage to Halloween because some of the stuff is shot outside and it's rare for horror films to be shot in the daylight. Mm -hmm. And when they are, oh, man, are they creepy? Neither the Living Dead did that. Halloween did that, and It Follows has some of the scariest stuff outside in the daylight. It's just a great idea for a horror film. Yeah, that's there's a. I'm glad you said that though, because so, sometimes I've guests on and they just say, you know, all current stuff is terrible. But I think there's a lot of great uh, current horror movies. I do too. I'm not much into the jump scare stuff, which most horror films are today. Mm -hmm. um, but It Follows is not really into jump scares at all. It, it's all about for those that don't know. It's about a demon that is passed uh, from person to person through sex. Mm -hmm. So it's like an STD. That's where he got the idea from was like an STD. That's a demon. So it's passed from person to person. So to get rid of it, you got to have sex with someone and pass it to them. It's a great idea for a movie. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and that that's where, and so that that's a recent film that actually does work. Yeah. Yeah, it was, uh, my friend Annabelle and I went to see that. Um, it played midnight before it really got a buzz. Yeah. And so we, we just go, uh, I go see like everything that comes out, but it was played midnight movie. And I was like, yeah, well, let's go see this. It's a weird horror movie, independent horror movie. Yeah. And it was like, it was very original and like you said, very creepy. And it's great. It's one of yeah. the best films. It's just, it's a lot of fun. Yeah. 
And I, I, obviously, I love watching movies at home, but there is nothing like watching a movie on the big screen. Nothing. And I, I tell everybody, because people tell me, oh, I saw 2001. Oh, I saw. And I'm like, no, You, if you see it on what we're looking at right now, a screen, a computer, uh, on a on a phone. Yeah, you're not I can't really, imagine watching. <laughs> I, but you know what? So many, so many Zoomers yeah. are watching stuff mainly on their devices. And I'm like, you're not really experiencing the movie. You got to see it. Most movies were made for the big screen. They weren't made for a little screen. Right. And some I think is overlooked is the sound because you yes. feel the sound when you're in the big screen. Yes. And you also can't escape it. It's right there. I guess you could look at your phone, but you shouldn't. But you it know, you, you can't go do other things. It's right it there. It just doesn't work. It doesn't work as well when you're, yeah. So you've got to see stuff on a big, you know, everybody needs to see stuff on a big screen. That's that's the best place to see it. Yeah. That same theater, actually, I went to see the 2001 when uh, was the 50th anniversary. Yes. This older guy next to me, and he told me he went to see the premiere of 2001 at that same theater. It's oh, a, a Coolidge uh, Theater at Coolidge Corner in Brooklyn. And I was like, oh, that's really amazing. <laughs> that is. That's awesome. Same theater, same film. That's the best thing. If you can see something in the theater, you saw it. In. But again, it's the big screen. It's just, yeah. you, I mean, 2001 was not made for anything other than a big screen. I mean, Apocalypse Now was made for a big screen. And it's, you know, you, you want to see movies on as large, the, the, especially those kind of movies. Yeah. Ones that were shot on CinemaScope or any kind of wide angle, they were made to be seen on a large screen. Uh, TV is TV, you know, TV's great, close-up shots, stuff like that. But movies like that were made for a large screen. That's how you want to see it. Yeah. Oddly enough, I also saw the Apocalypse Now uh, re-release at that same theater. But, Did the same theater, right, yeah. right, right. <laughs> Which I was happy it survived uh, COVID because there was, you know, it was kind of touch and go there for a while. But um, yeah, yeah, through we, uh, we, people donating money and helping out, which was very nice. That is cool. We we lost. I'm I'm in Los Angeles. We lost a couple theaters. Um, the the Cinerama Dome uh, went out of business, but they're finally opening it. I forget what company bought it. I want to say it's one of the streaming companies. They bought it. Uh, Tarantino's theater is still there. He yeah, only he shows does. he only shows film. Mm -hmm. He he has banned anything digital. Uh, you know, uh, yeah. So his theater still survives. American Cinematheque out here is great. The Arrow Theater, those all, and and they only screen film. So th those are great places to see movies uh, the way they were meant to be seen. So they're not dead yet. Yeah, I was at the New Beverly for the, my first and only time so far. Um, in 2019, right. when I was out in LA be right before the pandemic, and uh, I was there. It was Christmas Eve and they showed uh, Die Hard. Right, it's very. Right. It was a very. And then I realized it is a Christmas movie. It is a Christmas yeah. movie, man. It's a totally a Christmas movie. Yeah. Oh, that's great. He loves to show that film. I know he's shown it a few times. Yeah. Yeah. And the music when you're watching it again, if you go and you know, is this a Christmas? The whole the whole score is Christmas music. The whole movie. Yeah. The the great late great Michael Kamen did the music for that movie. He took a lot of uh, uh, Christmas carols. And blended into this into an action film. Yeah. So it's absolutely a Christmas movie. How could you not think of it as a Christmas? But I know there's the debate, but it is yeah. absolutely. But it's a not Christmas a debate movie. anymore. I say. It's I know. <laughs> it, it's been solved. It's been, yeah. it's been decided. And it's and it's a great movie. I think some some of the action movies in the 80s and 90s people think are just like dumb action movies, but uh, it's a lot of them are genuinely great movies. They really are. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Yeah. So uh, what your movie has a lot of um, action in. Heartland of Darkness. What what was that to film uh, some of the action scenes? So it was it was a lot of it was it was fun, but it was also challenging. Uh, many of the action scenes take place uh, inside that church, mm -hmm. uh, which is always kind of a challenge. We got shotguns, we got chase scenes, but but we did a lot of stuff on location. The film was very authentic in terms of the locations. Uh, you know, we have a we have an action scene where a character uh, goes into a gas station. And there's a thug. There's a he's a Satanist. They're all known by their upside down uh, crosses that have been uh, tattooed into onto their skin. So he goes in there and fights the guy briefly. So we had to create candy glass, artificial glass that he gets thrown through. So that was fun, you know, planning that, rehearsing that, blocking that and stuff. And then when he leaves, he goes on the highway. And there's a car chase. <laughs> and the car chase we did on the deserted roads of of mid. Midwest, you know, central Ohio, and we have the cars weaving in and out. 
We have, uh, you know, automatic weapons being fired. All of those weapons, uh, Neil, were added in post-production. The, oh, the, wow. the, the flashes of the guns. Yeah, we because we we couldn't fire Uzis on a <laughs> that might that might be a problem for law enforcement. So we added all that stuff in later, and it was a lot of fun. So the action scenes we choreographed and we shot them uh, on authentic locations. We didn't, you know, we didn't BS. We shot them where they where they're supposed to be. Yeah, I, I've noticed on a lot of these, there's a lot of. Um... A lot more production value for what you would think for uh, a smaller movie today. You know, yeah. back then, like the, the, there's a lot of cool action scenes. So there's also kind of a danger feel to a lot of these movies, I think, because it looks like the, you guys are really out there, you know, doing everything. Yeah, yeah. There, there was, I mean, there there were people. We had a scene in the film you probably remember with the early part of the film where they find a body in kind of a swampy area. And they lift they lift the sheet up, and the body's been eviscerated, and all of the organs. Uh, are are all over the place, uh, the, the intestines and stuff, and which, by the way, were real pig guts. Oh, really? And, oh, yeah. And and a runner, a jogger, we were filming that by ran by and saw we, we had we had we had two ambulances there, and they they actually looked and they were like, oh my god, they really thought it was a it was a dead body, yeah. and they one girl start, started crying and screaming. We're like, no, no, we're making a movie here. It's it's just a movie. But those those guts were real. We actually had our special effects guy, the great Scott Simonson. He went to a slaughterhouse, found some pig intestines and guts, put it in a in a in a, in a, a trash uh, receptacle, put it in his garage. It was 105 degrees in Ohio. Put it in there for the weekend. We went out the Sunday and started shooting it, and it was it was horrific. The smell. Uh, I don't want to laugh, but yeah. Oh man, it was. We all had stuff all over our noses to try to block out the smell. It was terrible, but yeah, we we did that, and uh, people thought it was real when they were coming by. But uh, <laughs> magic of movies, right? Yeah, no, and it looks great and it holds up. I love it. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, no, it's re- honest. Not because you're here. It's a. I really enjoyed the movie. And uh, I like all, like I said, the company's been putting out some cool stuff, but yeah. partly in the darkness. I, I thought it was shot on video, but it's cool to, to know that yeah. you did it on um, on 60 millimeter. 60 millimeter color negative. Yep. Yeah. How many, uh, how many, how many reels does that take? Uh, oh, man. Uh, so we, we probably shot, we had like uh, about uh, 50, 60 uh, camera, you know, in terms of the reels and stuff. And then we built from that about five or six master reels to telecine. So you you shoot your film on sixteen with the can with the canisters, the negative. Then you build the the the. You have to get a work print back then, and you have to build the reels together. And those are what you ultimately uh, telecine and work with. So we had about five or six big reels of the film put together. And when back then when you telecine you would do what we call color correction. You would try to match, uh, you know, the color, and you would do that when you're transferring to video. Today, like with The Lord of the Rings, The Hobbit, all those films, they do it all through a computer. Oh, man, if we would have had a computer back then, oh, wow. We would have <laughs> saved a ton of money just going in and and changing it through Pro Tools or After Effects on the screen. That would have been great. But today, I mean, back then, all we had was, like, basically – a video, an old school video kind of color correction thing that you had to use on a computer that was much bigger. And it took forever to do that. But today it, it could be done with a couple of keystrokes. Yeah, but at least I would assume that, that when you have the knowledge of doing it, uh, the, the longer version, uh, then having better tools in the future uh, will, will help you anyway. That's exactly it. The, the more, you know, as you go along, you get better tools to do the art. I think it was George Lucas uh, that famously said, uh, it's really ultimately, though, it's not the tools. It's not the cool software or the newest camera. It's the story. Mm -hmm. He said the story has to be really interesting, really cool. So no matter what tools you have, they all have to serve the story. That's ultimately what it is. Yeah, I mean, well, you know, like Jurassic Park has, you know, cool visual stuff. But if, if it was just that, you wouldn't be into it, you know. That's right. That's or you exactly. might, or they might have been to it at the time, and then like after a while, people wouldn't really care about it. Yeah, yeah, it's got it's got to have a good story. There's got to be something there that makes you want to turn back. Yeah, I, you know, his movies obviously are big blockbusters, but they're also good movies. Where I do think 
not all of them today, but a lot of like big blockbuster movies aren't necessarily good. They really are just a visual movie, but used to be a big blockbuster could still be a really good movie like Indiana Jones and yeah, Jaws yeah. and Jurassic Park. And There's a great Howard. documentary on Disney Plus uh, called Light and Magic. It's all about the, the creation of ILM. And it's from literally when it started in a warehouse in Van Nuys, California, uh, you know, they were literally filming in a warehouse with dust and dirt everywhere. And that, that was the original Star Wars New Hope film they were making there. And now today, the, the film, the series ends with their new facility up in the Bay Area, you know, state of the art. It's all computer driven. But it's interesting to see where the progression of the art, this, the, the science, if you will, goes from the early days when they were still shooting film and doing stuff like that all the way to today where you have computers and all this digital stuff, which is great. And again, it just shows you all this tools that you have, but you've got to have a good script. You've got to have, and I thought the original trilogy was great. I really did. I still, Oh yeah. Yeah. Do you, are you a fan of any of the the more recent ones? I am. I I thought the last, um, the last three, not the, um, I I thought the uh, prequels were okay. They weren't my favorite. But then uh, he went off and, and uh, or no, the last prequel film, Revenge of the Sith, that was, I thought that was pretty good because you got to see what happened to Anakin and everything. Uh, and that was interesting, I thought. But then the recent three have also been okay. They weren't my favorite, like the original, but they were still pretty good. Uh, Lucas didn't have much involvement with them. Yeah. Uh, maybe that's why they didn't work as well as the other ones, but they, they were okay. I thought The Last Jedi, which a lot of people don't like, I kind of still liked it. I thought it was kind of, it, it, they, they were, he was exploring things that hadn't been done before. And I always liked that about films, films that can push the envelope, let you see things you haven't seen before in a different way. I think that's the magic of film. It wants you, you don't want to just keep doing the same story over and over again. You want to try to do a different version of it and push the envelope. The new, the first one, I forget the names of it now, but the uh, was it episode seven. Yeah. It's basically like, uh, it's almost the same story as the first movie. It really is. It's kind of like, yeah, it's the, pretty much the first film, you know, Luke on a desert planet and all that stuff. Yeah. And I, I just felt that they kind of remade the first Star Wars film. I felt that way too. Mm -hmm. And I actually really like Rogue One, which is. Uh, yes, I love that movie. film. Yeah. I think it's the best of the new movies. I couldn't agree more. I, I just finished the graphic novel, the adaptation of that. And it's as good as the movie. It's really crazy good. If you haven't seen Rogue One, you got to check it out, people. It is it is the best of all the post-Star Wars. Yeah, I really... And um, I haven't watched the, all the shows yet, but I, I did like Mandalorian, but I haven't watched uh, the new... I don't have Disney+. Plus. I, I'll wait till some stuff's on there, then I'll get it for a month and, and binge watch everything. And then, yeah. Yeah, you too many streaming sites to have them all. Right, right. I agree. <laughs> I do want to see Andor because it's based yeah. kind of on, on Rogue right. One. So I do want to see that. I wasn't as impressed with Obi-Wan and... And Mandalorian's been great. That's been really yeah. I really good. like Mandalorian. I haven't seen Obi One yet, so I don't. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. But I'll yeah. I'll check it out at some point. Yeah, please do, please. Do. But I was really surprised with Mandalorian because I saw all the the cute Baby Yoda stuff, right? And right. I was like, ah, whatever. It's probably. Silly. And then I watch it. And I was like, oh, he is really cute, and and it's a really good show too. Yeah, and don't forget, we don't want to give away the ending of the first season. It's just, it's just great what happens with the first, the last episode of the first season. It, it's just great, and th and that's that's the way you want good shows to be to end on that big kicker that you go wow, and that was a big wow. The last episode of that uh, of that series, it was really good. Yeah, yeah, I agree. It was great stuff. Yeah. So, Heartland of Darkness. Uh, when's that coming out? I think it's coming out November twenty second. Uh, another month, and it's got a bunch of special features. It's great. Get the DVD. Uh, it's phenomenal. It's old school stuff mixed in with new stuff. It's great. Yeah, I really enjoyed it a lot, and I haven't seen all the specials, and I'm really interested in, in seeing them all because I, I would like to listen to the commentary. I'd like to see the, the documentaries, and uh, it I found it interesting, too, just the filmmaking of the time. Yeah, it's great. It's like, a, like we've been telling everybody, it's a time capsule of 1989, horror so you get a chance to see what it was like back then during the satanic panic that gripped the nation you get a chance to see this little movie that kind of touches on that and you got a great star with Linnea Quigley it's a lot of fun it's it's more of an action film action horror yeah. film than anything else and it, it's great yeah no I, I really enjoyed it and I hope people Thank check you. it out 
and, awesome. and it was really cool to uh, talk with you. Yeah, you too, Neil. This is great. Your website's great. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Really, really, really appreciate it. Cool. Uh, where can people follow you to see what else you're up to? Yeah, so I'm on I'm on IMDb and of course Twitter, uh, Facebook, all those good sites. There's actually a website, Heartland of Darkness. Dot com. You can go to that. You can see all the stuff we've been talking about. Oh, cool. You can also find a link to buy the film through there, too. All right. Very good. All right. That's been great. Thanks, Neil. Yeah. All right. See you. See you.